On to today's seminar, it's uh, headed by Mette Tjaf Hoibry, and many of you know Mette already. She has a background in social anthropology, did her PhD in health, and has for the last years been pursuing a really independent research career, partly anchored at the uh, regional hospital, partly anchored at the university, and in that space carving out a niche for what you might call a particular form of biosocial inquiries. So looking into how is it that the biological and the social is intervened and entangled with each other, in particular in terms of experiencing various aspects of health and in terms of figuring out how are decisions actually made inside the clinical world. Meta has also been spearheading the Open Your Data uh, initiative at, uh, at IMC, which the first Thursday every month, I believe it is, basically opens up a space for people doing more qualitative research to explore what is it actually like to be analyzing qualitative research? What comes as criteria of validity in these fields here and how might one creatively be opening up for it? So Mede, the uh, mic is on to you to talk more about what it is we're expected to hear today. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, for the introduction and, uh, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to share some of uh, the early analysis of um, and reflections on our work uh, from the Borderlands of Living uh, project. I will just share my screen here and get us, hopefully get us on with this. Yes. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so the Borderlands of Living project uh, has been ongoing since April 2019 and it's hosted, as Andreas said, at the IMC. It's comprising myself and two postdocs, Lisa Marie Andersen and Henne Bess Bolsbjerg. And currently we also have two interns uh, with the project, Christine and Alberte. So um, today we'll hear some of the early insights from both the research strands conducted by Lise Marie and by Bess in the project. And then I'll start us out here by just a few words uh, of the context and the origin of this uh, project and the overall focus. So this project is, you could say, almost a textbook uh, example of research arri arising between a clinical setting and an academic environment. Uh, and it really came about because I have this position, as Andres already mentioned, as an associate professor, which uh, spans the two. So in the hospital in 2017, there was an experimental uh, fMRI EEG protocol making its way uh, into the clinic with a focus on patients who had suffered out of cardiac, uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest and were not waking up after their initial uh, highly intensive treatment at Aarhus University Hospital. So in an attempt to examine uh, the possibility of using fMRI as a tool in future prognostic work, these severely injured patients were to be transferred uh, to a specialized intensive care setting for early neurorehabilitation at Silkeborg uh, Regional Hospital, and they would there be included in the fMRI protocol. So what the protocol was aiming at was a more precise way to diagnose uh, stages of consciousness between the vegetative state and the minimally conscious state which is important for providing the best possible uh, early neurorehabilitation to target uh, the intervention of this uh, best to the patients. So through, the, so though, though the, uh, so um, the protocol had really exciting uh, clinical prospects in this way, but it also raised uh, a number of concerns. So I had a knock on my door from one of the intensive care uh, unit physicians who were really concerned that this type of project, even though it was uh, exciting, could also uh, possibly introduce false hope with relatives and, and saw a number of, of ethical uh, dilemmas opening up. And from our discussion, um, you can say, uh, 
this Borderlands of Living project uh, was made possible. Uh, intrigued by the number of questions and challenges that this type of project uh, opens up, but also really keen to learn more about the knowledge making and the reasoning that involves in this uh, high stake relationship, you could say, between the research setting and the clinic. So just briefly to clarify, <clears throat> when we talk about technologies of detecting consciousness currently, uh, what's in use in the clinic are behavioral methods that employ certain scales uh, to detect levels of, of recovery uh, and consciousness. Um, and then there is the neuroscientific technologies, which are currently being tested uh, all around the world, but they have not yet been implemented as a standard clinical tool. So um, ready to go here is our team, the first day at the field, uh, heading into the early neurorehabilitation uh, um, facility at the ICU in Silkeborg and uh, all excited. Um, and then what happens was, what happened was what happens in most uh, research that you actually meet reality. So uh, after there had been two initial uh, fMRI scans in 2017, which I followed in the clinic, uh, basically no patients arrived for this uh, protocol. And we still have in the project an ongoing detective work to try to understand what happened to these uh, patients. And to make a really long story short, it's about uh, politics and organizational changes. Um, so what you'll be hearing from this project uh, today builds on the material that relates to these early scans, but also to uh, the way we then decided to explore the ideas and the intentions of this type of research uh, through interviews in particular around the research protocol and also the ethnographic work we've done to try to understand what's the usual practice of assessment uh, and interactions with, with patients with, with, uh, in, in a vegetative state or a minimally conscious state in the clinic. So despite the challenges of getting to study what we intended to study, uh, we'll invite you today uh, into this project, which is uh, tied to a very particular clinical setting uh, and the treatment of patients with severe acute brain injury. This is mainly in our work so far, patients with traumatic uh, brain injury or, st or stroke. And um, in particular, we invite you to think with us around the uncertainties in this field um, as clinicians uh, seek to assess consciousness and make prognostications for the future treatment and care or move towards uh, a withdrawal of treatment. So Lise Marie, you'll take us from here. Yes, thank you, Mede. I'll just uh, start by sharing my screen. So hold on a second. Yes, so thank you, Mede. Uh, well, um, I'm going to continue on this theme of meeting reality, in a sense, uh, because I just want to make a short introduction to where I come from and what my entrance is to, to this uh, project uh, before I go on to discussing our. Um, reflections from the project. Uh, so I am a philosopher and I, as I hope you can see now my, my little uh, ivory tower. Ivory tower. Uh, this is the, the main picture of a philosopher, at least if you come from outside of philosophy, uh, a person sitting uh, in a distance in an armchair reading a book concerned about um, different concepts and uh, and I have also been working on the issues of um, consciousness, amongst other, but also the mental uh, more generally uh, uh, from this uh, philosophical uh, perspective in some sense of uh, sorting out uh, concepts and defining uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for uh, certain mental states, for example, consciousness. Um, but in this project, um, let me see if I can get this working. Okay, 
Yes, I could. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, good. But in this project, what is happening is really uh, I am a, I as a philosopher is meeting reality in a in a sense because suddenly these questions about consciousness are no longer so abstract, but tied to the survival of a, a person. So for for the people that were um, well um, were following the of course the researchers, but the patients in this uh, context, you know, consciousness is really a, a matter of survival, and that in itself opened up a new, whole new perspective on consciousness for me, at least. So this is, this is how I came into the project and this is my, was my first experience of the project. So even though we haven't had uh, much um, um, a chance to follow uh, the actual implementation of the MRI and so on, we have been in the clinic and I have also uh, been around in the clinic and meeting reality in this way. And I think uh, what interests me is in, in some ways uh, a similar direction towards how something idealized and abstract in cognitive science meets rea the reality of the clinic. So this is also my focus in the project is um, how we go from something uh, like cognitive neuroscience on healthy subjects, um, making uh, group-based uh, uh, predictions um, to uh, having um, um, a, a prog prognosis for an individual, some, some person that we have to, um, um, or the, the clinicians have to uh, settle uh, the further treatment and to determine uh, whether um, to end it uh, or to continue uh, with rehabilitation. So this is this movement and uh, my interest has been focusing on uh, how uncertainties arise in the implementation of these new technologies. Um, so even though the technologies are kind of brought in in order to uh, deal with uh, uncertainties that have arised, arised in the context of the behavioral methods, there's also some new uncertainties by introducing new tools and how does this, um, my interest has been to kind of uh, try to trace these uncertainties and form a, a landscape of, uh, of such uncertainties and the knowledge making in this context. Okay, so as I said, I'm from philosophy and this is actually an anthropological project from the outset. And what I wanted to do in this, um, my involvement in this project was to try to combine some of the methods that I have from philosophy with anthropology. And uh, so, uh, on a practical level, what I've done is to uh, uh, do some interviews, uh, as Meta mentioned, and I've also been around in the clinic. And of course, I've also I also um, use um, the ethnographic observations that uh, Bess has undertaken and Meta has undertaken as background for my work. And I see this um, the philosophy and anthropology as two different kinds of way of going into looking at a landscape. So we already talked about the way the philosopher does it, but um, in the, with respect to the ethnographic research, it's more a question of to go into the landscape and seeing things from different perspectives and then kind of uh, collecting <laughs> or producing the um, uh, ethnographic material and uh, combining the views of many perspectives. Um, and uh, what we aim to do in this uh, project um, is to try and, and make a dialogue between the two approaches and um, thereby being able to cover uh, more, you could say, a, a more complex landscape, not necessarily kind of adding up to one big map, but more uh, in the kinds of tracings along um, uh, the world, basically. Yeah, so that's that's how we've been uh, working, and I want to show you. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, one or two examples, depending on time, uh, uh, on how we've been working with this and what we gain from from this kind of work. What we have done is to uh, base. Um, well, so what we've done is to uh, make the the interviews and uh, do the ethnographic work first, but then afterwards. Uh, I had looked into what um, um, had other people done of research in this area of uncertainty in medicine. And I was so lucky to find a, uh, 
a framework that I thought was uh, interesting and could uh, give us some um, starting point for the philosophical uh, uh, analysis and conceptual work around uncertainties. So I do, I'm just going to present this framework, which has uh, um, kind of been influential in some of us, our ideas. But at the same time, we have been criticizing the framework. And this is actually part of an article that we have uh, gotten accepted um, recently. Okay. So this is not to say that we worked from this framework, but what we did when we had uh, collected and made analysis of the empirical material, uh, we have um, then used this framework to kind of create a dialogue between that material and um, the concepts, our conceptual frameworks. Okay. So I hope you can all see the framework now. And um, the framework uh, is, uh, was created by Han uh, Klein and Aurora in 2011 as a suggestion for a general framework for uncertainty in medicine. So uh, you're supposed to be able to uh, kind of plug in any, any kind of uncertainty and find its way through this, uh, <laughs> in this framework. And they define um, uncertainty as an experience. Uh, an experience of, um, of ignorance. <laughs> it, the experience that there's something you don't know. And each particular in, uh, instance of uncertainty, as they say, that it has a locus that is a person who has that experience, but comes with the part of it being an experience. There has to be somebody who has it. It also has a source that is the um, original cause of uh, the uncertainty and it has an issue that is what is the uncertainty about. In our case we have the loc uh, loci or lo uh, locus could be either the clinician or the researchers. You could say that in some sense um, the real question here is whether the patients actually have a uh, loc could be a locus in the sense of having experiences at all well, we kind of left that out. That's not our concern so much because that's the, what the, the researchers are trying to determine. But our locus, um, the, the ones we're focusing on are the researchers and the clinicians. And what we'll, uh, what we'll present today, I mean, we have, we have been working um, broadly with um, uncertainties, but what I'm going to present today is gonna to be on the issues of scientific uh, uncertainty in the relations of uh, prognostication and uh, making a diagnosis. And um, Han et al, uh, they distinguish between the two, but we take uh, diagnostics to be part of making a prognosis. If you're, if you're not able to do a proper uh, diagnostics, you're not able to do a proper prognosis either. Um, and uh, in many senses of what the fMRI um, scans are trying to do is to improve the di diagnostics so that in order uh, for that to, um, or when that happens, we can get better prognostics for the individual. Okay. Um, an important thing about this um, framework is that it also talks about sources of uncertainty. Uh, so each individual uncertainty has a source according to this framework. You might criticize that afterwards, but we can, we can talk about it in this way for now at least. Uh, it has a source and they distinguish between three different kinds of sources when it comes to, uh, especially when it comes to scientific um, uncertainty. And one uh, source of um, uncertainty is probability. That is just plainly uh, the uncertainty of future um, events, what's going to happen. So um, if you play a game of heads and tails, uh, it's gonna, there's a probability of it being head a certain amount of time. Uh, there's no way you can change this uncertainty except for changing the coin, of course, but you can't change it by just adding more knowledge. Knowing more about the coins and so on will not change the uncertainty. The second source of uh, uh, uncertainty is ambiguity, and this concerns the nature of the, um, the knowledge of the, um, for example, the probability. How good is our knowledge? So um, it, re it is concerned the reliability and the credibility and the accuracy of uh, information. 
Uh, so if, for example, what we have uh, is a test methods where we have problems making the test, uh, uh, we can um, remedy this uncertainty by uh, making more advanced technologies, for example. So this is uh, an uncertainty from ambiguity is an uncertainty that can be fixed in some ways by more knowledge. That's the important difference. Um, they also have a third category, which is a bit of a combination in a way, but it's called complexity. And uh, according to them, it refers to aspects of the phenomenon that makes it difficult to comprehend. So basically anything that's uncomprehendable. No, uh, but <laughs> they define it more um, in terms of there's uh, two sides of this um, complexity. There's both that the world is complex that in itself, but also there's some a, a, an epistemological aspect where uh, that in itself, that it is complex, is uh, making it more difficult to comprehend. And so in some sense, we can uh, remedy this uh, um, problem by um, fixing the epistemological part and adding more knowledge in this sense. But of course, the complexity we can only add um, um, the ontological part where complexity, things are more complex, we can only change that by reducing complexity. Basically. So these are the, the categories and uh, what I'm going to talk today uh, about today is a very simple kind of uncertainty, uh, which is the scientific uncertainty uh, in diagnostics and prognostics uh, um, from ambiguity called methodological uncertainty and this is when something um um when that when we have problems with test or research methods so it's it's concerns the integrity of the sample or data um limitations of test methods are they precise enough are they accurate accurate enough uh and so on and uh, also issues around bias and so on um this is contrasted with uh uncertainty around uh, models or taxonomy, which is more like a conceptual, uh, you know, where you doubt the concept of can this test really happen? This is not what I'm going to focus on here. This has been a lot of debate about the possibilities of fMRI to actually show or um, prove, uh, ev give evidence of um, consciousness uh, in philosophy, but that's not what I'm going to uh, focus on here. Here it's more the simple methodological uncertainty. And that's because I have an example that kind of shows how we can use this framework to tear apart um, different kinds of uncertainties. And uh, I, what I think is good, uh, one of the things I really like about this um, um, framework is that it focuses on uh, different kinds of uncertainties uh, for different people. So it, it kind of uh, puts um, stress on uh, the fact that the low side plays an important role in defining which kind of uncertainty we're uh, dealing with. And I've, um, I've uh, brought with me an example of how this works uh, in our uh, research. So after we have made our analysis not based on this framework, we went back, um, to, we, we looked at this framework and then went back to our material and looked at how we could could um, analyze it in terms of this framework. Okay, so uh, here's, here's the case. Um, and it, um, the, the story <laughs> um, originates from uh, the first, uh, very first scans and it's based on field notes uh, made by Mede. Uh, so if we have any <laughs> additional comments to the exact situation, I will um, refer to, to Mede on, on this. But um, I'm going to present our analysis of, uh, of the situation and the uncertainties in this uh, case. So uh, what happened uh, under the one of the first scans um, uh, in 2007 was that uh, even though um, well, it was a scan of a patient with uh, agnox uh, <laughs> anoxic uh, brain damage and uh, the patient was thought to be vegetative. And probably uh, if you think as I did, when I first uh, heard this term vegetative, you think of a person lying completely still uh, or not even awake. Actually, I thought it was the same as coma, but uh, the vegetative state is actually a state where you, you um, in contrast to being in coma, actually have a rhythm of the day and open your eyes at certain times and 
are sleeping and not sleeping and so on. And in this condition, you also, uh, your body sometimes will make um, movements um, that are abrupt or, um, yeah, are very and very irregular. Of, and of course, this also happens in a, in a scan. So as a result of that, um, the researchers uh, who were undertaking the scan uh, during the during the scanning uh, commented uh, something. Uh, they commented like this: the images look like crap. And this is an uh, excerpt from the field note. Uh, this is what the researcher said: even the most creative analysis won't tell if that was a response or he just moved. So there's a, a clear sense of um, uncertainty about a methodological uncertainty about the. Uh, um, the possibilities of actually even measuring uh, uh, the, or scanning these patients in the fMRI scanner. And of course, this is very um, salient, a salient uncertainty for uh, the particular researchers. Um, and these are researchers who are not responsible for the clinical uh, procedures uh, or and the patients, but responsible for uh, the production of the fMRI scan. So uh, what uh, they did uh, subsequently was to introduce a light uh, sedative drug, uh, which could then mean that the patient would lie more still. That's in further um, scans, but not for this one, of course, that was not possible during the operation. But that would be one way of controlling this uncertainty. Of course, uh, such a sedative drug has the risk of uh, uh, bringing in even more uncertainties because these patients are already hard to, to, um, to scan in the scanner and reducing the level of activity, which a drug like that does, uh, brings in another uncertainty, um, which is also, of course, from ambiguity and a methodological um, uncertainty. Okay, but what actually happened uh, during uh, this uh, scan was that after a few days where they had a chance to make the analysis, they were able to, uh, um, to filter the, the results in a way that actually um, made it possible to find a response. And uh, this was, uh, I mean, of course, this was a, a, um, a surprise in some ways because uh, the patient was thought to be uh, um, vegetative. And what happened was that uh, Meta was uh, present when the uh, PI of the research was uh, delivering this message to the, to the clinic. And here are her notes from, from this day. Uh, we actually found something. We can actually see something. It's repeated over and over again uh, as the analysis is relayed to the clinicians. We're in a small circle around the PI and the printout of the analysis he's holding. He stresses this only means there's a response, as in opposed to maybe like uh, a broader consciousness or something like that. The clinicians are clearly affected by the news. This gives me the chill. It's, it's a bit alarming. This is frightening, are their reactions, while they start discussing if they should reevaluate their prior decisions to suggest to end it here. Okay, so clearly um, uh, what happened here was that they were able to uh, pro provide a res uh, or to detect a response. And this was a surprise um, to the clinicians as uh, the a uh, patient was expected to be vegetative, and in the vegetative state, this would be uh, a little responsive uh, when they were not expecting this. Um, what happened was uh, that the clinicians then tried to think about, oh, maybe I did see a response at the bedside after all, and there was some uncertainty uh, regarding this issue. But in the end, uh, the uh, clinician decided not to include the material, uh, the, uh, the data uh, analysis in the uh, final um, briefing of the relatives um, and in also in the prognostication uh, due to the original um, uncertainties that were occurring during the scan. So the clinicians had been uh, present during the scan and had seen the movement and seen the reactions of the researchers uh, responsible for the scans and uh, decided that uh, the result was, uh, uh, you know, too uncertain to, uh, to go into the prognosis. So 
in a sense, you can see here that there's a, a movement uh, with the, where we have the same issue and the same source of the uncertainty, namely the methodological uncertainty, but there's two different kinds of uh, ways of viewing it at, the, uh, at this part of the situation, because we have the researchers responsible who are actually saying, we did actually find something. We're pretty certain that there's something here now. So the uncertainty has been removed. Whereas we have the clinicians who say, well, you know, I'd still believe that this uh, uncertainty matters so much that I don't want to put it into prognostication. And of course, this is um, because uh, here we have a, or uh, we assume that is because, uh, that here we have a more complex situation where a prognosis involves um, taking into account a lot of different kinds of knowledge. That is, of course, the clinical observations, which were contradiction, contradicting the uh, fMRI scans in the sense, and also, um, of course, all sorts of uh, other um, uh, it, um, other data and observations from the patients. And um, yes, so so they, they that has to be integrated, and that's a complex situation. And so, in the sense, uh, the uncertainty from before is kind of uh, kind of uh, changed into a new um, uh, setting where it's surrounded by other uncertainties, which determines it to be more uncertain in a way and uh, not, uh, um, um, yeah, uh, standing in the way of making a decision uh, on that uh, in prognostics. Okay, and so it cannot be remedied in the same way. So that's the, that's the example, just have to, be able to see the clock on my screen. <laughs> okay, so, um, so yeah, so we have two different types of uncertainties in this sense, and uh, but also a kind of uh, different reactions to how um, uncertainty is spelled out, uh, even though they have the same sources and the same um, um, issues. So reflecting on how we um, have used this um, and what it's good for this framework, you could say, I think it, it, it provides a possibility of tracing sources and issues as I just uh, did, but also that um, it also provides a, a possibility of recognizing um, uncertainties that are not necessarily present in the situation. That is, uh, for example, there was not um, much concern about um, conceptual uh, uncertainties, as I mentioned, which has been a huge debate in philosophy, but which wasn't uh, present, uh, at least when when the action takes place. Um, but also there's a risk when you, what I found when I was trying to uh, go from this framework and use it on our empirical material was that there's really a risk of focusing on specific events of um, uncertainty and you know, spelling out the source, the issue and um, the loci, but then neglecting uh, how it's, it's um, changed in the situation and, and how context actually uh, did, plays in on, um, um, on, this, um, on this uncertainty. So in a sense, what they're, even though they have the low side in their framework, uh, there's a tendency to neglect the, how the context of other uh, uncertainties will affect um, you know, our conceptions of uncertainties. And I think this is something to, to work further on, but that was one of my reflections on this. Uh, good, okay, so. I want to I'll now give you uh, another case, uh, which um, says a little bit more about our methods. So this, this first case was uh, how, uh, how to, how we have used the, the framework and how we have seen, seen some of the landscape. Of course, this does not cover all the uncertainties that we looked into. Uh, this was just one example. Um, we had a lot of uh, other different kinds of focuses also in, in that framework, for example. Um, but I want to give you another example also of how combining uh, philosophy and anthropology also in our own work, how that worked, uh, how uh, 
from my perspective, how uh, we can use the empirically uh, produced material uh, to get uh, a knowledge that I would not otherwise have gotten with my, my usual methods. And um, let me see, just hold on, sorry, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so th this was the case. Um, I think what this happened when we were looking at um, in the empirical setting through interviews at what happened when they were developing the uh, paradigm for the fMRI uh, study. So at first glance, it seemed like um, um, the, that they were developing a new, uh, or they were developing a new uh, paradigm for this research. And at first, it seemed like uh, this uh, way of developing the paradigm was incompatible with standards of good research practice. And, but what I want to uh, explain is that through our observations and interviews and looking through the material a second time, we became aware that actually that was also part of managing the uncertainty in the clinical situation. And that's uncertainties that would not arise in the context of um, kind of everyday uh, cognitive uh, neuroscience on healthy subjects. Okay, so. So in the case of developing the stimuli for the MFI, MFMI study, uh, they were focusing on auditory um, stimuli because, uh, for example, a visual stimuli uh, was not, um, it was um, less certain that the patients in the scanner would actually be able to recognize any visual uh, stimuli because they were often um, closing their eyes or, um, or yeah. So, um, so they went with the audio uh, stimuli. And the initial idea was to actually use a, a stimuli that was developed for a previous or an already ongoing EEG study. And in this case, it was um, a talk of a uh, study uh, with an oddball paradigm, where there's a standard and a, a, a deviant um, um, condition and where they variate. I'm not going to go into much detail here, but uh, let me know if you have questions uh, afterwards. But the important thing here is that there's a variation and um, the uh, words or pseudo words that are repeated either as the standard or, uh, <laughs> or the deviant uh, is um, uh, tracks into levels of a language processing or is supposed to do that. So we start at uh, the the distinction between, for example, real words and pseudo words and see if that could uh, be recognized in um, the measurements in the brain. So, but the, the idea here is, is that it's a kind of complex oddball paradigm uh, that tries to track into all levels of uh, language processing all the way from just automatic hearing a sound to uh, hearing a, a word in your own language um, to hearing, to understanding how that <laughs> that it is a word <laughs> in a sense. Yeah, so that was the idea. But what happened was uh, that when they did the first scan, um, they, they recognized that uh, these patients were actually um, probably or likely to drift in and out of uh, consciousness. Uh, and they were afraid that the, the patients were actually going to fall asleep in this condition. They're lying uh, um, on a, a bed in the scanner uh, and um, it's not like you can talk to them uh, in between, uh, or, although they can talk to people, but they can't get a response and ensure that they're actually awake and so on. So they were afraid that this kind of um, a very complex paradigm would make people uh, fall asleep simply. And also it didn't actually um, um, fit with the, with the goals, the clinical goals in, sort of, uh, in a certain way, because what they, as they were saying, what we're looking is to see is if there's anything at all. In Danish it's holy gim. Uh, are we able to break through to something uh, or not? And all the levels of different processing uh, does not seem so important in this clinical setting. It's more like a, a biomarker of is there something or not. Um, so in light of this, uh, the researchers chose to develop a new um, paradigm 
a new stimuli and paradigm, uh, which they thought were uh, where they thought that they could uh, uh, keep the person awake. And uh, what they decided to was to use some popular music, uh, and as they, they they called it, for full blast, on full blast. Uh, and a simple contrast paradigm of playing the music and not playing the music uh, and playing some music with uh, um, um, lyrics and some not. Now, the problem was that this was already ongoing and uh, uh, the tests were you know, going on. So the, um, they were unable to test this on healthy subjects first. And this is, of course, uh, not uh, the standard um, procedure in cognitive science. Um, and so there, there was a weighing uh, of, um, of the uncertainty in this case, the uncertainties of making sure that uh, we were able to measure the right things in the clinical population, uh, and the uncertainty of not ha having a stimuli and a paradigm that wasn't tested. So basically, you can see it in two ways, either as introducing new uncertainty by introducing a new stimuli, you know, by not complying with uh, standard research, uh, general research standards, or you could uh, look at it as we did the second time, which was, well, this is actually also a case of weighing up uncertainties because um, the, the stimuli was, the original stimuli was thought to be too complex for the goal. And also uh, even the original uh, stimuli was actually not tested in uh, fMRI, it was developed for EAG. And there's also some uncertainties uh, crossing that uh, uh, different technologies. This is an example of how, uh, you know, going from something <laughs> ideal in a sense and then uh, meeting reality uh, in a certain sense as well and weighing up the uncertainties. I'm not necessarily saying that there's any right way of uh, interpreting this of the two or I'm not uh, want to go in that direction, but just saying that there's different ways of looking at it. Yes, so that was uh, what I had my examples of how uh, I have worked in the project and the uncertainties that I have been focusing on and also how I view the relation between philosophy and the empirical uh, material and the anthropological uh, aim of the project. So that was me. Bess, will you carry on? Yes, for sure. I'll start. Um... I'll Liz share. Marie, Liz Marie, will you take off your screen? Well, um, so I hope you can see mm -hmm. the slide. We are continuing. So, um, I will read up from a paper just to be sure to get the quotes precise because um, as mentioned, our project is connected or concerned with both the professional practices at the clinic and at the research setting. So um, um, this part of the talk is based on the ethnographic fieldwork that's taking place in the clinic between May 2019 and January 2020. So we will start walking this landscape together. My objective for sharing excerpts from the field is to highlight the process of knowledge making around these patients with a specific interest to unfold the social practices involved in the clinical assessment of consciousness. Some of these social practices are indirectly or directly ascribing personhood to the unresponsive patient, as I will discuss later. And this seems to be an important feature, both in relating, well, in relation to the processes of knowledge making, as well as from a societal point of view, as ascribing personhood to the unresponsive patient influences the potential of the healthcare professional to interpret eventual signs of contact, consciousness, or awareness as systematic responses from the patient, which is important for further neurorehabilitation. So. Oh, I don't know why it started from the very beginning. I just have to shift through. Sorry, it takes a second. 
So I would like to invite you into the setting and introduce you to the subtleties involved in determining consciousness in patients who are perceived as either being in a vegetative or a minimal state of consciousness by sharing an observation from the field work. Before entering Peter's room, a young man aged 21 who suffered a severe head injury due to a fall from a window on the first floor, Lissy, a nurse in her mid thirties, states that she no longer expects to receive a response from Peter because his condition is so bad. She explains that earlier on in his trajectory, there had been islands of contact where those at the unit could communicate with him. This was done by asking him to look up when he meant yes and down when he meant no. But this ability has disappeared and they no longer see improvement. But that's why it's good to work with someone who's a bit more inexperienced and still open to the fact that something might happen. Lizzie says by pointing to her colleague Judy, who takes part in the care. One of the first things that Judy notices after saying hello to Peter is that he has a visible boogie in one nostril. Judy explains to Peter that she will remove it. And while doing so, she acknowledges that it seems uncomfortable to him. A little later, during another care routine, she asks Peter, does it hurt? Peter releases a big sigh. I know you don't like it, Judy responds. In this small excerpt from the field observations, the expectation of the patient's inability to interact in a meaningful way by signaling with movements of the eyes is contradicted by adjusting to subtle reactions and sounds coming from Peter, which indicate that the nurse's actions are influencing him. This exemplifies an everyday care interaction at the unit. At the same time, it is also an example of the subtle interactions between healthcare professionals and patients with severe brain injury, where personhood is ascribed through social practices, entrusting certain preferences, valuable relations, moods, and sometimes even humor to the patients in this marginal borderland of living. Clinically speaking, these patients are, as mentioned, categorized as either being in a vegetative state or in a minimal state of consciousness. And both these categories reflect an ambiguous state of consciousness, which creates this clinical uncertainty about the potential for rehabilitation. And such categorization of the patient's state of consciousness is extremely difficult, partly because it may fluctuate over time, and partly because the prognosis depends on a number of individual specificities relating to factors such as age, neuroplasticity, location of damage to the brain and origin of the injury. And still, these categories are important for the clinical decision-making around the trajectory of the patient. So to zoom in on the relation between the interpretation of states of consciousness and the social practices involved in this kind of knowledge making, we will explore how healthcare professionals use multiple technologies in their clinical interaction with these patients and how these technologies are integrated into the social practices related to ascribing personhood to the unresponsive patient. In our research, technologies are understood in the broadest sense and range from brain scans to close monitoring of vital functions and also include the clinically based sensory practices to assess the ambiguous states of consciousness. In regard to the monitoring, it serves several purposes as the unresponsive patients transferred to the intensive care unit also have a multitude of medical needs to be attended to. So monitoring helps to secure the survival and stabilize the physical condition. This is supported by measurement of temperature, oxygen level, respiration, heart rate, and the need for nutrition. Along performing medically relevant observation, this 24 seven hours monitoring also enables the healthcare professionals to use the variation in these measurements as indicators for their interaction with the patient, thereby assisting them in practicing personhood. An example of the social practices involved in the close monitoring is to be found when observing the actions taking place around Julia, who has been admitted shortly after a car accident. She's a woman in her mid-twenties. Here at the beginning of her trajectory, 
the healthcare professionals think that she is physically reacting to the shock from the accident as the temperature is rising and falling together with her heart rhythm being very unstable. At the same time, as they are closely monitoring her to adjust her medicine and initiate other kinds of treatments, they use the changes specified by the monitors as an account of emotional reactions to different sorts of stimuli. Let me exemplify how the social practice of ascribing personhood is facilitated by the use of technologies at the beginning of Julia's trajectory. As part of regaining the best possible physical functions, she has to wear specially designed footwear, very alike to foot splints, to ensure that she may eventually be able to walk on her feet again, even though they have been immobilized for a longer period. Having been moved from the bed to the wheelchair and being put on the foot splints, Alice, the nurse, notices on the monitor that Julia's pulse has reached 110. This is probably because she's been moved to wheelchair and messed around with. And she got these splints imposed on her. She doesn't like them. The nurse is monitoring the interaction with Julia through the heart rate monitor and interpreting the rising pulse as a reaction to the activities and the discomfort from these. In this way, the nurse is not only observing a physical change, but is ascribing personhood to Julia through her interpretation of Julia's reaction as an emotional dislike in connection to the physical discomfort. This observation is feeding into the conce conceptualization of personhood that we are orienting us towards when drawing on anthropologist Daphna Shia-Vatesh's definition of personhood as something to be recognized as a social, embodied, and sentient being. With this definition, we seek to trace personhood as shaped through the interaction between the nurse and the unresponsive patient, namely that the patient is understood or expected to be social in terms of responding to input from others and embodied, understood as capable of performing certain bodily tasks and sentient in the sense of having self-awareness and some continuity in regard to one's life history. This expectation of a manifestation of personhood seems fundamental for the negotiation of clues, emotions, responses occurring as the healthcare professionals are seeking to determine the patient's state of consciousness. When contrasting observations from Julia and Peter's trajectory, where the entanglement of personhood with the interpretation of the subtle sensation is played out quite differently, we may see this more clearly. In Julia's case, hardly anyone believed in her recovery in the beginning. Jackie, a nurse being only a few years older than Julia, describes that the thing that Julia does with her mouth, which looks like the movement babies do when they are suckling, is not a good sign. Instead, it indicates that the reptile part of the brain has taken over. Therefore, Jackie does not believe that she will recover. Rather, this signals that she will become a vegetable. But on the other hand, she has a strong body, Jackie says. Another one of a very experienced colleague who shares this is the same opinion. I do not believe in it, but one should never extinguish hope. She claims to have seen something like miracles on the unit before. This characterization of Julia as a patient without much potential for rehabilitation is supported by those subtle observations done across the disciplines working on her recovery. For instance, one of the occupational therapists forces her eyes to open to check in on her, but is not able to establish the sense of contact with Julia. This is a common experience among the healthcare professionals in the beginning of trajectory, which is also expressed during a caretaking situation where one of the nurses tries to interact with Julia in connection with having to check up on her diaper. Julia, I just have to see if your diaper needs to be changed, the nurse says before checking up. And then to make the interaction more mutual, she asks, can you just look up here, please? Lisa, the nurse, awaits a response. Nothing is happening. When being outside the room, Lisa explains, I don't think there is contact. 
If she looks me in the eye, it seems random, like a coincidence. Working with establishing eye contact and using the movements of the eyes as a tool for communication is very often a part of the early neurorehabilitation, as the patients are silenced due to the trajectory and commonly challenged to be or by an inability to move. But focusing on the eyes to establish a clear sense of the patient as a sentient being might also occur spontaneously. This happens in a situation where one of the other occupational therapists Rahim is about to make Julia ready for the transfer from bed to wheelchair when she suddenly opens her eyes. Oh, it's good seeing your eyes, Rahim immediately responds, but without evaluating whether this was a sign of her being consciously present. Simultaneously with determining whether it is possible to establish contact with Julia by looking her into the eyes, Peter is still being monitored, but with the before mentioned anticipation that he is not capable of re-establishing the previous use of eye movement as a communication tool. They still notice when he's spontaneously looking at someone, like when one of the younger nurses is gently rubbing lotion on a sore area on his head and he's then opening his eyes. Are you watching me, Peter? The nurse jokingly responds to make him aware that she is noticing what she conceives of as an interaction. In another situation, Peter is being mobilized. Sandra, the physiotherapist leading the activity, is asking Peter to look up for yes and down for no. After having asked him to do so, she waits for Peter to move his eyes. Nothing is happening. She continues the activity and tries to make Peter respond again. If you can hear us, you have to show us. She instructs him to either blink or open his eyes. Still, nothing is happening. A little later, she tries to contact him again. Try and look at me, she encourages him. Peter seems asleep. She touches his arm with a sense of caressing it and then continues to his cheek. Then she repeats the instructions from before. Now her head is even closer and she seems very observant. Something happens. Maybe the left eye opens a bit says Sandra, as if trying to decide whether Peter was actually following her instruction or whether it was not a sign of the... Um, later, Sandra concludes that he did not succeed in opening his eyes. He clearly did not show himself, as they sometimes explain, when referring to the actions necessary for the patient to perform to convince the healthcare professionals that they are consciously responding. Our argument is that such, such assessments of the patient's state of consciousness determined by their ability to relevantly respond is strongly influenced by how the professional ascribes personhood to a particular patient. I'll try to show you how. Sorry, yes, yeah. Perceiving the patient as a person with a life history is a reoccurring feature manifesting itself in the very introduction to the patient, for instance, before entering the patient's room. Right after having mentioned the most salient physical issues, a short characterization of the patient as a person is taking place. In the case of Julia, one of the first things being mentioned is that she is a mother with a son about one and a half years old. The family was driving together when the car accident happened. The car had a frontal collision with a truck just as she, as she, she had loosened her seatbelt to find the pacifier for their son. That was why she was injured so hard compared to her husband and their young son. When talking about Julia, the family is always in the forefront and as the relationship between the young child and her as a mother is one of the concerns that the healthcare professionals discuss. When including her relatives in the recreation of her life history, the healthcare professionals both listen to the stories of her previous life and um, engagements and observe the different levels of involvement that the closest relatives manifest. Prominently is Julia's mother-in-law, a very energetic and young looking woman who has a close relationship to her grandson as Julia's husband and their child 
are now living at her place. She wants to be able to support their emotional and practical needs. Julia's mother-in-law is very present at the unit, trying to come by every night to give Julia a neck and foot massage. This frequent presence of Julia's mother-in-law and her husband and son manifests Julia's identity as a mother, which is considered by the healthcare professionals when ascribing personhood to Julia. The continuity of her life history is not only manifested through the regular, re regular visits, but also through the actions taking place at these visits. During a family visit, her mother-in-law tries to establish such a connect continuity of Julia's identity as a mother. While having her grandson on her arm, the mother-in-law shows him the photo where he and his, mother's, his mother are together. She points to the picture and says, this is your mother, and then points to Julia saying, this is your mother. She repeats this movement many times as to make clear that his, that his mother on the photo is the same as the one in the wheelchair. The personhood built around Julia is not only the one of a young mother, but also one who deserves a chance, meaning being referred to the next level of neurorehabilitation. From the perspective of her mother-in-law, Julia is a fighter and has a strong will. She's therefore capable of working her way through these obstacles that reduces her ability to take contact with her surroundings. The healthcare professionals in charge of the decision are of the same opinion that Julia deserves a chance even though she has not yet shown any clear signs of consciousness. Ascribing personhood to Julia influences both relatives and healthcare professionals' understanding of her potential for neurorehabilitation. The social practices involved in constructing personhood around Julia are present during the clinical interaction, but also very strongly during fa family visiting, where the healthcare professionals would be witnessing how they insist on her, her identity as a mother. Personhood is here constructed on two levels, by an immediate interaction where physiological responses are interpreted as emotional reactions, and by connecting Julia's life history to her present state of being, so that her surroundings are allocating a previous personhood to her. Julia's trajectory is contrasted by the decision to terminate Peter's neurorehabilitation and refer him, him to a nursing home where no specialized neurorehabilitation is being offered. As one of the doctors explains, he might end up dying of pneumonia, sorry, pneumonia, as he's been extra vulnerable to the infections because of the permanent hole from the trajectory. When constituting personhood in relation to Peter's trajectory, one of the things being mentioned is his family situation and his previous drug abuse, which may have served as a kind of self-medication to handle his diagnosis of ADHD. As one of the nurses explains before entering the room, the family has not been in contact with him for five months prior to the accident because of the drug abuse. The absence may have influenced the way the family has handled the accident, as they seem very detached, she reflects. The family consists of six children, where several are still minors, keeping Peter's parents busy with attending to their needs. In addition to these exp explanations, the, the nurse adds that they have experienced a loss of a child before, which may influence their ability to cope with the situation. In Peter's room, the rare present, presence of family visits is recognizable in the withering flowers contrasted by the many, many family members at the printout photos pinned at the board across on the wall visible from the patient's bed. When discussing the termination of Peter's stay at the unit, the leading nurse refers to the blended information stemming from his previous condition as a drug user and psychiatric patient as well as the nature of the accident, which has been investigated by the police as an attempted suicide. The leading nurse firmly insists on having provided Peter a chance to show himself during his prolonged stay at the unit, but they don't see any progress in his condition. 
to support the decision of terminating his stay and referring him to municipality care, his life history is woven together with negative expectation of his brain, brain's plasticity, stemming from both the use of drugs and having a, psychri uh, sorry, a psychiatric diagnosis. It appears as if Peter's personhood becomes questionable, partly because of the impressions of having a hard life and partly because no one is maintaining the living condition or connection to the one he once was. By not insisting on the need of a continuation of his life history, he's slowly fading as a person, which could be observed when some of the healthcare professionals shared their thoughts on his condition while still being in his room and speaking of him. The insecurity in determining his responses as cognizant also indicates an influence of the overall understanding of Peter's personhood. They see him as someone who may have given up and possibly decided to end his life. And the fact that his family has withdrawn from him, from him adds to the conclusion that he does not have much to live for. Constituting personhood around Peter is still depending on the two levels mentioned before, through the immediate clinical interaction and the reconnection to his uh, previous life. But in contrast to Julia, it seems like the personhood ascribed to Peter by aligning him with his previous life history is marginalizing the few and uncertain responses that he might have expressed. Here, his life history influences the construction of personhood by limiting the importance of the immediate interaction taking place. And as his responses are neither clear or systematically repeated, the healthcare professionals can conclude that he has not convinced them of his potential for further neurorehabilitation. So what did we learn about the knowledge making taking place in the clinical setting when focusing on the construction of personhood through observing the social practices around patients with disorders of consciousness? Firstly, this part of our study shows that knowledge making is a social practice exemplified by ascribing personhood to unresponsive patients. And secondly, the ethnographic observations demonstrate the subtleties of how the social interaction with the patient can be interpreted in the clinic as a reconstruction, shall we, as a reconstruction of the patient's life history and thereby contain elements of an evaluation of the patient's life quality rather than their clinical potential for neurorehabilitation. This teaches us that clinical knowledge develops not only as an interpretation of clinical measures assessing consciousness in these patients, rather it is an interaction between knowledge in the making and the social practices ascribing personhood to patients not being able to systematically respond. This kind of evaluation points out a moral and ethical dimension of the process of knowledge making, which may indicate that the evaluation of personhood ascribed to these patients are under influence also by more societal trends of usability and meaning that could render certain aspects of personhood more valuable than others. So as my part of the talk, so I will leave it over to Mede again to make some I gather our reflections. Thank you, Bess. Will you take the next slide? Yes, sure. Yeah, so just to wrap up after these uh, exciting presentations, um, you can just leave it on full. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, the project uh, has uh, started out in April 2019 and we're running uh, till so far till September next year. The field work is more or less complete by now. Um, we started out, uh, luckily, uh, long before um, COVID-19 hit us all. So, uh, so it would have been completely impossible to do this kind of project uh, now. Uh, but we'll, we have a potential number of interviews still to follow up with. So currently we're analyzing this huge material and have started writing um, about it as well. And then we're expecting uh, to, um, to make a closing workshop where we'll try to bring 
together uh, the practice and the research part of this uh, of this group and try to uh, discuss with uh, people who have been specifically engaged with the project, but also with others and uh, hopefully with a couple of people um, uh, coming to work with us uh, from abroad as well. Um, some of the findings that we have in this project and how it may uh, be brought to bear on practices within research or clinic uh, in the future. And just the last slide. Yes, just the, um, Lise Marie mentioned the, the work on uncertainties has been accepted for publication. So that's the lower one of these two uh, references that we have out now. And the other is a, a commentary to um, another work about doing uh, functional neurodiagnostics and how it affects uh, um, families' decision making. Thank you all. So we have time for questions and commentaries and please, if you can turn on your camera, it's so nice to see that there are people and not just names out there. So for questions, just raise your hand in the uh, camera window or use the raise hand in the participant window. Yep. Any questions who wants to begin? Any starters or takers? Yeah, Aya? Sorry, I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. <laughs> Anyway, thanks so much for a really um, fascinating presentation of the work. Um, and also I found it quite moving, particularly your piece, this. Um, and this is also what my, what my question is about, I suppose. Because if the conclusion is that the kind of evaluation of the person's um, value of life, I forget the particular wording, but I think you know what I mean. If that has to do or decides the prognosis, how do you then position yourself in this kind of ethical terrain as researchers? Both I'm thinking in the actual situation of overhearing this or looking at these kinds of decisions being made, but also more kind of reflectively afterwards. I guess either of you could respond to that. Should I start, Meta? Well, as I was the one witnessing it, you may say, um, of course it provokes a lot of thoughts, but it's also, I think it's, um, um, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's very hard to have an opinion on it when you are at the clinic because you have to trust their, their decision and they might, you know, articulate it in specific terms to make it understandable for you as a researcher, but they, they've been with him for nine months. So it's quite a long time to stay in a unit like that. So when they say, well, he had a chance, they really gave him a chance in many ways. But nevertheless, when they are explaining their decision, they are drawing on these features from his personal life to say, well, maybe it is better, you know, and it's 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 very in a way it's very questionable because they were really only relating to you know measurements and saying well we really can't see any any signs of consciousness then you say okay it's a clear case but when they have this kind of uh, stories woven into their decisions it becomes a much it's a different landscape that you have to navigate so I'm 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 witnessing it and there's been like uh, other incidences where we were more alert in a way, because it was shorter periods of, uh, of time where they could really evaluate the patient or where they felt that some structural changes didn't give any kind of patient the same opportunity. So they hit a wall in a way where they had to fight for the right for neurorehabilitation, even though you had Down syndrome, for instance. So um, 
Well, it's it's a very difficult area to 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 work with. So I I admire them for like wanting or having to take these kind of decisions. But of course, we have to pinpoint where they're not aware enough because we think that those social norms might sneak in some places where those patients are easy to identify with as a nurse almost the same age, having a child only one year older. Of course, you find it horrible in a way that, you know, if it was me, this question comes up, you know, during the breaks, lunchtime, they sit and, oh God, it's hard. But as a professional, they have to distinguish between like um, what they see and what, well, in at least some ways and what they feel. Mary, you want to add in on it? No, I, I think, thank you, Bess. I think that's a really excellent kind of, uh, of reply also to, again, stress the kind of the way that the uncertainty also builds up in these kinds of, of decision-making processes. And I think it's, it's, it's not much spoken of, but widely acknowledged uh, actually within um, the practice of medicine that there, there are these types of biases that sneak in and that introduce certain types of inequalities that are really, really difficult to, um, to, um, to speak about introducing them into who gets to treat patients, who gets access to certain treatments, who, uh, how it differs. And it's very extreme in this case because we're talking about, um, well, not in this case ending treatment, but basically getting a treatment that is definitely going to place this person in a less uh, advantaged situation than, than a continuation of, of the neuro rehabilitation. But, but you can definitely see it, the same type of inequalities also in cancer uh, treatments or in, in surgical options or things like that. Yeah. I have a question then, uh, I have a couple of questions, but, but maybe I can start with one for, for you, uh, Lisa Marie. <clears throat> so I didn't know this varieties of uncertainty in healthcare before. It seems like a really, really interesting framework. And, and one of the things they seem to do is to, in a sense, you know, carve uncertainty into probability, ambiguity and complexity, right? And I wondered in this particular instance here, where in a sense, you know, further analysis of the neuroimaging data suggests that maybe there is something there that one couldn't see at first. Would that be a matter of saying that what the technology does here is that it really adds in complexity to the situation or how, how, would, you, how would you interpret it? Yeah, I think I think that's uh, that's a, a good way. Of, that's one of the ways we actually phrased it also in in the paper that this this adds complexity. So, in um, our our paper is about how you know there's a vision for this fMRI to actually um, enable the doctors to be more certain uh, in uh, prognostics and diagnostics. So the the idea is that this should be like an objective tool in order to determine whether there's consciousness or not. But it actually, you know, once you draw it into the clinical setting uh, and the act of having to make a, a prognosis, there's so many things that you have to draw on that it of course adds to the, to the complexity, especially of course, in cases where it contradicts the clinical assessment, the original clinical assessment, which was the situation in this, in this case. Um, the we have a, a from from the field notes uh the expectation was uh, we have an insight into that the expectation was that you know that these results would confirm the clinical assessments of course that would be the expectations and in that sense you know in this in that case you could say well then it doesn't add as much complexity in a way uh whereas in cases where it contradicts you know you have the added yeah, complexity. I think and actually, you could get even more because you could have EAD and 
fMRI at the same time, and they're actually expecting not to necessarily give the same uh, answer as well. So yeah, so it just, it, it definitely adds. I think that's a very interesting finding because you know, I've, I've followed the field and I've uh, examined the PhD in this field once, and, and clearly the argument from neuroimaging is that you know, now that we have neuroimaging, given the right algorithms and the right methods, we can decide whether people should live or die more or less on an objective ground. So, so mm -hmm. the old argument, at least in part of the field is precisely the opposite, namely that now we can get you know, the objective decision-making criteria. And that always felt a bit, you know, I felt a bit uncomfortable with it, but it's, I think what you open for is a different interpretation that actually what these technologies might be providing us is actually creating a space where it becomes possible to accentuate and to talk about this in different ways, right? So it's actually opening mm. up a space of possibilities rather than just saying, now we have a highlight from a neuroimaging result to life or death. So this is just surprising, but beautiful. There's definitely this uh, idea of, uh, of, of uh, an ultimate proof or uh, this idea that you could give, um, that the scans could give uh, an objective, uh, con yeah. A final final answer to whether um, it's happening or not, and I think that um, that um, actually it's it's um, it's also interesting that there's an epistemological difference to between which answer you get. So if you get a positive answer, um, that would be more then you know that there's some uh, kind of consciousness. Whereas if you get a negative answer, you can actually not use this uh, kind of findings as um, as an ultimate proof. Uh, in any case, because uh, there's so many other uncertainties as in, in the process itself, uh, even if we have um, a perfectly worked out paradigm and uh, the research uh, is at a later stage, because that's important as well, we're investigating the research at the very early stage. So, but even when we have developed this uh, research, uh, we have to um, assume that the person has been awake uh, in, the, in the scanner and that uh, they have, you know, they might uh, drift in and out of consciousness. So you never know when, you know, at the time of the scanning, whether what, you know, what the result will actually be, and and uh, you'd have to have several scans at least to um, to determine, like, to to um, determine uh, uh, whether there was a negative result. So to to be more certain of it, but there will always be some uncertainty attached to a negative result. Any questions or follow-ups on this year? I guess I can I can briefly add to that that uh, there are you know, different kinds of let's say neuroimaging evidence because if we do look at some of the prognostication strategies out there, something like an N twenty, which is if you give uh, electrical stimulation to the um, to the median nerve. There is actually a cortical response 20 milliseconds roughly after that, which is used as a prognostication criterion, right? Where you can actually, in, in terms of this, a negative outcome. So the, the absence of that response. I mean, we're not really at the sort of covert cognitive level, but still we, it is a cortical response that we're, we're, we're um, looking at. Yeah. Um, uh, that's used in the negative terms, whereas some of the stuff that that you've been discussing in, in, in the talk today and so on, of course, more with respect to covert uh, signs of, uh, of, of consciousness, right? And that's where we have this discuss discussion of, of what can we actually use a, a negative result for, right? And that's also, I mean, embedded in the way we do the analysis. So I think that and I, that's at least something I see in the literature now being discussed quite openly. Um, so, I mean, I haven't followed it, the discussion the same way you, as you have, Andreas, with respect to the promises that it may have had early on, right? But at least I see a, a strong skepsis towards what can we actually use the neuroimaging methods for for now. I've got a lot of noise in the background, so I'll just mute myself again. That's just a quick, quick comment from here. Well, thank thank you. you for that comment. Yeah. And then I have a question uh, for you, Beth, because it's <clears throat> you know it's it's really interesting to see the that personhood in a sense is not just something that the person does, but really something that people around the person do to a large extent, right? That in a sense, personhood is something that's here very concretely ascribed by 
the mother-in-law coming in and saying, you know, she is a fighter and uh, bringing the child, etc. So it's it's very much about description as well. Now, of course, Shievetsesh, whose notion of personhood you draw on, you know, she started out by studying pets in Israel. And her point seems to be that, you know, people do very much the same things like pets, that they can become part of the family through exactly the same processes that you describe here. But it seems to me that one of her take home messages is that certainly among pets in Israel, but maybe more worldwide, you know, you can easily just as fast make them into non persons as well and take them out of the family and take that aspect of personhood away from them. And I wonder whether you see similar processes ongoing in the clinic that in a sense, and that could be very interesting to follow, you know, just as what does it take to grant a personhood status to that vegetable that some would call it it's a very interesting metaphor of living organisms to that vegetable you know the vegetable is not a vegetable but a person but then at some stage you can almost depersonify it and it can become a vegetable or another thing again and have you followed that process as well it's uh, thank you for mentioning it it's a very interesting uh, line of thought um i we haven't like taking it out in, into this kind of a radical way of perceiving the patients being unresponsive as non-persons. But I think when we are witnessing some of the processes taking place, we are seeing how they are like slowly fading, we are calling it, or they becoming like in an intermediate state where they know of them to be like um, when, they, when they are transferred into the municipality caretaking homes, it's kind of a social debt in a way. Mm -hmm. So so in this way, they are, you know, um, not detaching themselves, but in a way they become less interested in the patient when they know they're going to be transferred mm -hmm. to, to, to these kind of caretaking homes. And it's interesting for me as a researcher as well, because I had to notice in, in one of my notes that when, when they talk about patients in that way, the healthcare professionals, I as a researcher also had like a different kind of perspective on the patients, like being less interesting or having like, oh yeah, but they, they, are, they are off or they are, they are not, you know, they are not conceived as, as interesting subjects anymore and I just had to notice my own reaction to become aware of this kind of I don't know if it was mm. difference in the engagement or whether it was the story told about the patient because it, if you dive into it there was a lot of negotiations taking place in these uh, situations whether they were present or not present for instance when they had emotional reactions were they uh, like a, a tear falling whether this could be interpreted as like emotions or whether it was more instincts. So, so when they, they knew of the patients being like referred to municipality caretaking homes, they would certainly try to uh, use the perspective of this being like an expression of instinct or fear or something else, but not saying, well, it was because the family was visiting and the girlfriend was there present sitting at his side. So I find that highly interesting, but I, I don't think they are becoming non-persons because still in this more immediate way of interacting, where you are seeing these cold, small adjustments to the other, it's so, in a way, so natural to perceive of each other as persons. So they're not treating them as bodies or non-persons, but uh, yeah, we could dive into that or investigate even further. Other questions or comments? So thanks a lot, uh, Meta and Bess and Lisa. It's really interesting view on not just consciousness and brain scanners, but also people and persons and relatives. Um, join in also for the Open Your Data discussion on Thursday. Uh, I don't know what is on the agenda there, Meta. Can you, you know what's, what will happen there? Yeah, uh, on Thursday, Aya will share uh, a data problem from her ongoing study with us. So, um, so for more specifics on that, you'll need to join us on Thursday. And Aya's project is, of course, about embodying academia. So, 
Yeah. In a sense, it's another really interesting interface between bodies and agents and spaces. Uh, next week will be week 42. Uh, some have kids to look after and uh, things like that. So we don't have anything planned for that week, but we'll be coming up again in uh, Tuesday in week 43. So in the meantime, uh, enjoy and take care.